when I first started practicing mindfulness and meditation, um, I was living in uh, Beijing, China, and uh, found an old Taoist hermit who kind of took me under his wing and he didn't know much English, but he conveyed a lot through his presence. and kindness. And so I would go visit him a few days a week and get in a taxi and drive to the outskirts of Beijing near a old forest and just kind of show up. He didn't ask for money or anything, but we would just kind of sit there and um and practice and his sense of peace and compassion and steadiness felt like the complete opposite of how i had been living i had been Kind of frantically busy, aimed at, um, you know, succeeding at work, Just kind of exporting a lot of things from ch from China and Thailand and Vietnam to the U.S. Uh, you know, kind of worried about career. I wanted to travel the world. There was something about my teacher's presence that really spoke to something deep within. And I remember during a silent meditation, thinking, by the time I die, I want to have cultivated these virtues, these abilities, this presence, because that felt deep in my bones to be the most important thing I could ever do. be present for myself, for this life, for my family. Or new friends. I also realized I didn't know when I would die. I'm not diagnosed with anything. I hope to live many, many years. And I wish the same for all of you. And no one really knows how long we have. You know, people pass away from meteors that come out of nowhere, brain aneurysms, random shootings. And again, I don't wish that for anyone. And this is one of the, the truths to life. We just don't know how long we have. 
And so when I put two and two together, I decided to put pretty much all of my energy towards cultivating presence and love. And I asked my teacher, should I become a monk? And after a little bit of back and forth, he said, yes. And at that point, I didn't know if I was going to be a monk in the Taoist tradition or Buddhism or something else. Um, a little bit later, I uh, moved to Jerusalem for a while, walking around the old city of Jerusalem amongst very holy people from at least three different major traditions or religions. I was listening to the Dalai Lama on my CD player at the time talk about like this advanced meditation stuff. Most of it went way over my head. I didn't really know exactly what he was talking about, but I was inspired by it. And I thought, you know, I should really do this soon. Um, and I found a, a Buddhist monastery and asked them if I could ordain, and they said yes. And then I uh, I called my boss at the time, and I said, I think I'm going to be a monk. And he wasn't totally surprised, but um, he said, you know, maybe you should wait a year or two. Um, you know, I could use a little more help. I'll give you more money. I'll fly you around to more countries. You know, you can have some fun before you <laughs> put on robes. And it was tempting. And so I called the monastery and I said, my boss is offering me a bunch of money and travel and, you know, I can just do it in a year or two. And uh, they said, Sean, you don't know when you're going to die. You could die tomorrow or in six months and miss this opportunity. Okay, you're right. And so I, I ordained, maybe a month or so later, gave away all my possessions, shaved my head. I used to have hair. <laughs> uh, and um, spent a couple of years as a monk. Uh, and it was interesting because on my uh, first retreat as a monk, where we, um, this was in Northern Thailand, we took a bus to the mountains and um, I was maybe ordained about two weeks at that point. And uh, sort of my monk leader um, asked me and a few other people to reflect on the top 10 moments of our life. The top 10 meritorious moments of my life. Meritorious meaning moments of sense of wholesome love, gratitude, generosity, connection, presence. And to think of the top 10 most meritorious moments of my life up until then. And so at that point, I was thinking of moments of, you know, deep stillness and meditation, moments where Love was expressed with my parents, my sister, um, moments of wholesome, like accomplishment of helping others, things like that. 
I'm sure all of you can think of plenty of wonderful, wholesome moments in your life. You know, and, and we can rank them or not. It's not a big deal if we we do that. But um but my monk leader asked us to do that as a precursor to sensing into this breath potentially being our last. Often called mindfulness of death or marana sati. Marana is basically death in old Buddhist lingo and sati is mindfulness. And when we reflect on our top 10 meritorious moments or wholesome moments as a precursor to sensing into this breath potentially being our last, um, it can help foster a sense of surrender and peace and acceptance with life. The next day, uh, my monk friends and I got back on a bus and rode back to central Thailand. But on the way, the bus driver was going recklessly fast through windy mountain turns. And I had a premonition or maybe just an intuition that our bus was gonna fall off the mountain. And so I started reflecting on my top 10 meritorious moments and sensed into this breath potentially being my last and really surrendered to that truth with a sense of peace. And then our bus rolled down the mountain and hit a very large tree. And that tree fell off a cliff, but it saved our bus. Um, one of my monk friends passed away and the rest of us were in the hospital for about a week. I was there with vertigo for about a week. But as the bus was falling down, I felt incredibly peaceful and everything was in slow motion and I was fine with it. I don't mean to imply that we don't, we shouldn't tell the bus driver to slow down or anything like that. In retrospect, I wish I had. But the point being that, um, this practice can be a wonderful practice whenever we think we may be in danger. Um, and it can help us to remember the beauty of our life. Um, Later at the monastery, um, as I was cultivating a lot of these practices of mindfulness of the body, mindful movement, mindful walking, loving or um, equanimity practice, these types of practices, um, I noticed that I was in my head quite a bit. Um, as a monastic, you have to follow the Buddhist monastic code. I was in a very orthodox tradition. Um, and these are sets of rules <laughs> that monks have to follow. And um, Sometimes it can feel a little dry. Um, 
You know, you don't have entertainment, you don't have music, no screens. It's basically just you and a cushion, <laughs> basically. And it's easy to get in the head. And it's easy to strive in our practice. And I think for a lot of people in the West, a lot of people in America, in the United States, Australia, Canada, the UK, when we talk about effort, it can be easy to think that it's about thinking your way through it or striving. Thing that was helpful for me and for a lot of Westerners is to remember that mindfulness is not brainfulness. It's not headfulness. And that for a lot of people, when we talk about the mind, you know, the heart is a major component. Some people refer to mindfulness as heartfulness. Some people like Jack Kornfield and Ram Das will refer to mindfulness as loving awareness. Now, I don't mean to imply that the mind doesn't include the head or the brain, but the mind can en encapsulate our whole sensory apparatus, including the heart. And so for me, in terms of effort, um, what helps sustain my effort and help lubricate it and help create a sense of spaciousness with effort and help, help it become right effort or wise effort, what it practices around loving kindness. Um, and I love this book called Food for the Heart by Ajahn Chah. It's basically transcripts of Ajahn Chah's teachings. Ajahn Chah is the teacher of Jack Cornfield and me. <laughs> um, but my point being is that when we talk about effort and when we talk about mindfulness of death too, we can. it's easy to get caught up in our heads. Very understandably, you know, many of us are rewarded for our critical thinking skills and we have to get a lot done, you know, our job and family and life. So remembering to cultivate the heart and remembering that effort is not so much up here, it's here too. It's a whole embodied awareness. And so when we practice mindfulness of death, of uh, noticing each breath as potentially being our last, can we relate that with gentle tenderness? And notice the sadness or the fear that comes with that. And that's okay. That's a part of the practice too. And tending to that. Tending to that reactivity or those just natural feelings. And then coming back to the breath as potentially being this last breath. So the Buddha called mindfulness of death the most powerful mindfulness practice. And it's not taught a whole lot, especially for being the most powerful mindfulness practice. For me, this practice helps to clarify 
my priorities, helps me remember what's most important, and reminds me to keep cultivating these virtues that I hold most important. And so for each of you, it may clarify different things. You know, what's important to me may not be important to you. We all have our different values and priorities. But regardless, this practice of mindfulness of death can help us to remember what's important to us inside and help remind us to tend to those things with our awareness and our intention. Um, after a couple of years of being in the monastery, um, I read a book by Joanna Macy, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, the book was called um, Coming Back to Life. And um, it was a, um, a wake up call for me um, in the sense that it, it really, brought home the fragility of humanity and the fragility of our planet. And the possibility of our extinction. And in a way, it was like a mindfulness of collective death. For me. I'm not normally this dark or macabre, by the way. <laughs> um, but that that book um, uh, awoke a really strong sense of compassion for for all living beings. And I decided to leave the monastery um, and, and try to help share these practices of mindfulness and compassion with as many people as possible. And I got really, really lucky, got a job at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, supported Jack Cornfield and the community. Rick Hansen, and um, learned how to integrate these practices with daily life as a layperson. And um, so I owe a great deal to Joanna Macy for her work with sharing these truths of our fragility and also the practices that help us reconnect. Um, in the chat section, I'm gonna post a link to a, a course, a free course of her work based on that book for whatever it's worth. And I see Martha also shared a link to Joanna Macy's website. So I highly recommend Joanna as well as Sharon Salzberg and Ajahn Chah. Um, with mindfulness of death, sensing each inhale as potentially being our last, um, it can bring up a lot of resistance. 
Um, Donna shared that uh, this talk is something I need to hear, even if I'm having some resistance. And I imagine that's true for a lot of you. I do want to say that if um, some of you have tendencies towards deep depression or suicidal thoughts, that this may not be a suitable practice um, by yourself on a regular basis without the support of um, a trusted guide. And that uh, bookending this practice with loving kindness and self-compassion is always a good idea. And this practice is meant to help us grow into this embodied understanding, this experiential understanding. And it takes courage. Um, If we practice this on a regular basis, what tends to happen is that we'll work through our reactivity, we'll notice the barriers to surrendering to this truth. And oftentimes, especially if you're doing this on a retreat or at the end of a long day long, um, there's a tipping point from kind of thinking your way through this practice to a complete full surrender that can sometimes lead into something very unexpected. Um, some people will have premonitions. Some people will enter jhana concentrated states. Some people will um, kind of feel like they're sensing into past lives. Um, for each person, it's a little bit different, but something powerful can happen when we totally let go of this practice. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha called it the most powerful mindfulness practice there is. Um, I do encourage people to kind of relate to this practice from the heart rather than from the brain. Um, I'll say that um, uh, I think that incorporating this practice near the end of a retreat whether it's an at-home retreat or a silent retreat at a meditation center somewhere uh, can be really helpful. Um, I'm gonna post a link in the chat section to uh, just a, a blog post around some strategies for creating your own home retreat for free um, in case going to a retreat center is expensive or you don't wanna to take too much time away from family or work. But I highly recommend using retreats as a way to deepen practice, rekindle um, energy around practice and strengthening your mindfulness muscles um, for this type of wholesome effort that we're talking about of cultivating these virtues. Um, one last thing I'll share before open it up to questions, 
is that there's a, a book out um, called Mindful Self-Discipline. Um, you can find it on Amazon by Giovanni Dinsman. But it's basically a book on wise effort. Um, it's a very thick book filled with strategies and practices for um, cultivating a regular practice, cultivating mindfulness throughout the day, and having sort of a wise um, discipline around your practice, written by uh, a, an advanced practitioner. Uh, the author is Giovanni Denstman. Um, but you could put mindful self-discipline in Google or Amazon or something and, and find it. Um, yeah. So I'd love to hear what's coming up for you, either from the meditation, anything I've shared, um, anything at all. I'd love to hear what's coming up for you. Uh, yeah, am I un unmuted now? I think, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Sean. That was um, quite profound. Um, just kind of well kind of a question and comment because on the one hand it sounds that a meditation like this on death could lead to despair um and then on the other and i'm going to forget the poet that um rick often quotes about um this poem that ends in what will you do with your one precious life? I may not be saying that correctly. Um, so I think having a meditation like that reminds me of that line in the poem because not being mindful or just getting so caught up. And today for me was a day of throwing many darts toward myself and probably others. Um, and then to have this meditation and think like, oh God, what a waste, you know? And <laughs> to, to spend all that energy on this kind of foolishness and getting caught up in these petty things, um, there's a precious life to live. But but again, my, yes, Mary Oliver, thank you. Somebody put that in the chat. Um, but my concern, would be that it can also lead to a sense of despair. So could you speak to that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Yeah, so for most people, um, there will be some challenging um, emotions that come up. Uh, and it's very understandable. Um, you know, no one wants to die, or I don't want to die. Um, and we don't want to lose loved ones. We, you know, there's, there's a great deal of sadness that can arise and fear. Um, and so the practice is to bring mindfulness to the, those reactions and those feelings with gentle, tender awareness. Um, and if it feels overwhelming, we can um, bring self-compassion, more of a um, structured form of self-compassion. Um, and seek support. Um, this meditation today uh, was relatively brief and we kind of touched on the, the heart of it rather briefly. And I tried to like bring a sense of 
um, caring, heartfelt awareness um, throughout the, the guidance. Many times teachers will teach it in a very dry way. Um, here I tried to bring some heart and keep it relatively brief. Um, yeah, if there's some unprocessed trauma, I think it's helpful to um, uh, reserve this practice for time when you're with a therapist or until after a significant amount of healing has taken place. Um, I think it's important moments like this to debrief and, and share and be met by each other. Um, yeah, but the, the reactions are part of the practice um, and working through those with mindfulness can help soften the reactivity soften the despair, soften the sadness and the fear. And we can begin to, to work through those, those tangles and hold them lightly and allow those feelings to process with our awareness. And um, oftentimes when we do that, that sense of preciousness tends to increase and we kind of come out the other side with um, oftentimes with gratitude um, or even just the realization that we might be taking life for granted um, and that um, it can be useful to notice impermanence maybe a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, it's, and this is why it's not taught that much, <laughs> um, because it can be difficult to work through some of these feelings. And so for those of you who feel um, like it may be a little much, then um, no need to practice it on your own. But for those of you who feel like it can be useful, um, then you know, I offer this as a as a practice to try. I hope that's helpful. Question from Jenny. Uh -huh. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. So actually, I very much appreciate this practice. And um, I uh, have on my phone, actually, it's an app called We Croak. And it says in Bhutan, they say contemplating death five times a day brings happiness. And so five times a day, you'll get a little reminder about, you know, precious human life and you know, making choices about what really matters. Um, I have a, a chronic uh, pain condition that, that cut my life at least in half. And then I had breast cancer and the breast cancer really made me wake up and say, you know, what really matters? What really, really matters? And, you know, I don't know, I got three years, I got five years, I got 20 years. I really don't know. It just made it very, very present for me. Um, and so I find that I can just stop in the middle of the day when I'm, when I'm feeling the anxiety, when I'm feeling rushed, when I feel like things are overwhelming. I just know that question to stop and say, okay, what really matters here? And it's usually around people, about making connections, doing things that are that are important or nourishing myself. So I'm sorry, it's not particularly a question, but a Tremendous um, appreciation, um, Sean. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, yeah, I wish you a lot of healing and love. 
Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, um, Liz in the chat section said there's a um, program called A Year to Live starting next week at Spirit Rock or through Spirit Rock. I highly recommend that program. And it's basically mindfulness of death, basically. So it's a wonderful um, structured program offered by very senior teachers. I think Vinny, I don't remember the teachers, but... Um, Anyway, thanks for that comment. Question from Kathleen. Uh, yeah, Sean, I'll keep this brief since we're almost at uh, 7.30. Um, but I have a somewhat similar situation to Jenny and I've done one year to live. But it seems to me from where I am, it seems to be a very long way to actually be on a bus that's going off the cliff and not and to be um, in pure equanimity about it in the kind of stillness you described. So tell me, that seems to me to be a very advanced state in this practice. Um, from your experience, would you would you agree with that? Thanks for taking my question. That's a great question. I I uh, I don't know if it would if I would call it advanced, but I think that um, I had done some work before ordaining of letting go of possessions, identity, money. <laughs> I had let go of a lot of the things that I had identified with mm -hmm. or craved. Um, and I think that was helpful. Um, and I, I do think that reflecting on, say, like a top 10 list of meritorious moments was extremely helpful for cultivating a sense of wholesome love and appreciation. Um, there's a sense, there's a a sense of acceptance um, that comes or that came for me through that practice um, and just meditating a lot was really helpful to, to stay with that cognizance that this breath could be last and um, I think now if I was on a bus uh, in the same situation, I might not have the same reaction. In fact, I've been on buses uh, that are going fast in the mountains since I was ordained. And I was really scared. <laughs> so, um, you know, this I think there's hope depends. for us. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends on the situation, the day, time of life, how much you're practicing, et cetera. So, you know, now I'm a husband, a father. Um, circumstances are a little different, so it's a little bit. Uh, I relate to it a little differently right now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.